I've done a lot of seminars over the years. I, I came up with this seminar, not this exact version. I, I, I change it every year based on my experiences from the, the previous fall. I love this seminar, especially today, because people are pretty interested in traveling to hunt. Uh, generally, if you look at the, the license numbers and the, you know, how many tags are we selling, hunter numbers in general are going down. The one bright spot there, there's two bright spots I should say, bow hunters, we're adding more bow hunters than ever. If you hunt over the counter unit in Colorado, you probably believe that. And then women are coming into the sport more. Uh, so that's helping us, that's saving us a little bit. But I love, I love the fact that bow hunters now are, they have access to the information and they're willing to travel. The one thing that I see, and I get contacted all the time by people who are like, I wanna go elk hunting, or I wanna go, I've never hunted mule deer, I just dream about it or something. And even with all the information available, it's still like there's like this mental hurdle, like it's either too expensive or it's too hard to understand, or I just don't know where to go. Or we have these ideas that if you're gonna hunt elk, you have to go to Colorado or something like that. And I've been doing this stuff long enough where I have a pretty good system down for figuring out where I wanna go, uh, keeping it really cheap all do-it-yourself stuff. I'm gonna talk all public land and just talk about the opportunities that you can find out there and how I find them. So the first thing you gotta ask yourself though, what am I gonna hunt? Um, we were just talking about elk hunting before this. Usually when people ask me from the Midwest, they, when they contact me about going hunting somewhere, this is the two things they want. They either want pigs, they wanna go somewhere to shoot a bunch of pigs, or they want elk. Um, I, don't, I don't have a hog segment in here um, because it's, very hard to go find a place to do that on public land on your own. You think you could drive down to Texas or Southern Oklahoma or somewhere and hunt pigs on public land and that they're everywhere. And I have never, I have found public land that has hogs on it at certain points, but it's not something I would drive 14 or 16 hours to go do. Elk on the other hand, not very easy either, but you have the realistic option of doing a fairly reasonably priced do-it-yourself public land elk hunt but I have to say a couple things about elk. Any, any of you guys that have been in here, you know what it's like. We, we dream of elk hunting and uh, the typical six by six, 330 inch bull walking across the meadow, screaming, snot flying out of his nose. Amazing experience. The reality is if you're gonna go do an elk hunt on your own, it's like 83% suck. It, maybe maybe more depending you know depending on the weather there's a lot of it it's it's extremely difficult we all know we got to get in shape all that you know if, if you don't if you don't get in shape you're just not you're not giving yourself a chance we we know that stuff we don't need to cover it what i will say about elk i think everybody should go do it i think you should try something else first if you've never traveled or you're limited in your traveling hunts try something else first and i'm going to talk about those with that disclaimer out of the way there is nothing quite like being on the side of a mountain with a bull bugling close by you. The, the, the overall experience is truly special. So I don't want to discourage anybody from that. And if you're ready and you've got a lot of experience and you're willing to do the research and everything, go for it. Just expect it to be very, very difficult. Rewarding, but difficult. So at the other end of the spectrum is the antelope. Nobody wants to go hunt antelope, right? I love antelope. And I think they're an amazing first Western hunt for most people. There's several reasons for that. First off, I think they're the best eating animal that I've ever had. And people will say, that's crazy, because if you screw them up, they're like a bear. If you shoot a bear and you don't get that hide off pretty quickly and get it on ice, bear is no bueno. Antelope, if you shoot an antelope and you drive it around the back of your truck and it's 90 degrees and you're in Wyoming, and you know half a day later you finally get around to cutting it up, it's no good right away you take care of it unbelievable besides that for the for the first timer or for somebody who doesn't have a ton of experience traveling to hunt antelope are very easy to find they're not very easy to get close to but you can always be in the game so if you're in a if you're looking at a random state i don't care where it is wyoming you know western nebraska somewhere and you're like i want to go on my first hunt it's going to be antelope if you wanna just go spot and stock and be around animals the whole time, you'll be able to do that on public land. That's a huge thing. And it's not just a morning and evening thing. Like if you go on a whitetail hunt or a lot of times elk, 
you know you don't have a lot of activity in the middle of the day if you want to push it and work hard you can do antelope all day long now the good thing about that is if you go bow hunt them and you don't want to sit on a water hole like i don't want to do because it's incredibly boring and it's like torture it's a good way to kill one it's just no fun if you want to go try spotting and stalking and test yourself antelope are amazing they are very confident in their ability to see you first and it's something they will do almost every single time you ever try to stalk them but they do have holes in their game and once in a while they'll bed in a place that you can crawl up on and it's it's an incredible experience the good thing about antelope besides that is it's cheap. A lot of really easy to get non-resident tags. If you're a bow hunter, there's there's seasons where you might be able to start like August 15th or August 20th. So you're, you know, a, a month ahead of when the opener would be here. Really cool opportunities out there. And it's a great chance to test out some gear and figure out if you're really ready to go live in a tent and work hard. Cause it's not easy. You're not gonna be climbing mountains, but it's just it's just a good first experience. A middle ground hunt between antelope and elk would be mule deer. I would say personally, if you said, what, do you, what would be the most fun for you to go do for six, seven days on a hunt that's, that's something I could afford easily and, and find within half a day's drive of here, it would be spotting and stalking mule deer. Uh, we're probably all whitetail hunters in this crowd, right? Everybody here hunt whitetails? So we're ambushers right? We find spots to sit. We wait for them to walk by. That's how we hunt. That's how we basically have to hunt whitetails, especially here. The spot and stock thing is an entirely different process. And it is, it is so much more in the moment and enjoyable because you can make something happen. It's not like, okay, I scouted this out ahead of the season. I hung this tree stand. Now they're going to hopefully walk by if the conditions are right. You can go out there and find animals and make something happen all day long. Mule deer are a little bit tougher to hunt all day long because they can be harder to find in the middle of the day sometimes, but if you're willing to pick apart the shadows and stick with it, if you have nothing else to do, which you won't, you can be in the game all day long. And the cool thing about a spot and stock hunt is it can feel very, very impossible, especially if you're not used to it. I'm not very good at it. I get about six days a year to do this. So an entire lifetime, I get more time in a tree stand hunting whitetails in one season than I've got my entire life spotting and stalking probably, or pretty close to it. The good news about that is you, you can get a lot of opportunities if you do your research. And the crazy thing is if you get eight or 10 stocks in, you're gonna get into bow range of one of those critters. And it's incredible where you get busted, you get busted, you get busted, and all of a sudden something works out where you crawl in there and now you've got that big mule deer rack sticking up 35 yards away in the sagebrush and it's like unreal. It's a, it's a surreal experience, but it can be done. Um, it's really, really cool opportunity. And mule deer are like middle ground expensive, right? Their tags aren't as expensive as an elk, be a little bit more than a whitetail or an antelope. Um, but there are some really solid mule deer opportunities over the counter, a guaranteed draw within eight or 10 hours of here. And most people think you got to drive, you know, 12, 14 hours to get into good territory. Awesome opportunities close by. And of course you got whitetails. We get, we get locked into thinking if we're gonna travel, there's two ways to look at it. We're either going for something we don't have at home, so it's gonna be the elk or the mule deer, or the antelope or something. Or if we're gonna travel for whitetails, we're going to Iowa to kill a 180 incher, or we're going to Illinois to Pike County, or we're gonna to go to Kansas and pay an outfitter. There are so many incredible public land whitetail hunting opportunities that are guaranteed tags over the counter, close to here, that it blows my mind. You really get an idea of how tough a state like Minnesota or Wisconsin is to hunt for whitetails when you go to some of these other states. Um, you can have an amazing hunt on public land. If you do your research, if you're willing to do the work, incredible opportunities out there. And so I always tell people, if you've never left this state to hunt whitetail somewhere else, like if you're a hardcore bow hunter here and every year, you know, our gun season opens first weekend in November. If, you, if you're like, I just wanna go hunt the rut somewhere, you don't have to wait four years to draw Iowa. You can if you want, um, you'll have a good hunt, but there are lots of opportunities in the Dakotas, in Nebraska, Oklahoma's incredible. Northern Missouri has some awesome opportunities. There's really, really reasonably priced tags out there and you can do, you could do a whitetail hunt for an Iowa quality deer on public land by yourself for seven or 800 bucks, all included. And that's, 
and, and you'll have the the experience where you're doing it yourself. It's a lot of opportunities close to us. So we got to dig into the details a little bit about whether you can get a license or not. This is so easy to do today. I mean, we have, I, I heard a stat the other day when I was, I was listening to this podcast and they were talking about how, how much more powerful our phones are as a computer than the computers they used to land people on the moon 50 years ago. We could find anything we want on our phones right now. And so this used to be a process to figure out where you were gonna get tags, how did you apply for them? Can you just walk into a Walmart and buy one or do you have to go to a specific spot? Really simple. What I'll say about license availability, over-the-counter license versus drawings, I don't wanna discourage anybody from doing the drawings if you wanna buy some points in Wyoming or somewhere for an animal. Just, just buyer beware, because if you look at, even if you wanted to go start buying Shiras Moose points in Wyoming right now, you'd be like, all right, well, I'm gonna pay 150 bucks a year, whatever it is for the preference point. Eventually I'll draw that once in a lifetime tag. No, you won't. Um, the, the point pool is so big ahead of you that you'll never get that tag most likely. And so some of it depends what state you're looking at too. It, it varies, but, but do your research and figure out now for these a little bit less desirable animals that aren't the once in a lifetime moose or sheep or mountain goats. If you want an elk tag, a, a premium draw elk tag or a mule deer unit or an antelope unit or a good whitetail tag, you can get in and play that game for sure and get there. You know, it might be two years, it might be 10 down the road. And I'm, I'm not saying it's not worth it, but don't forget to, to just do your research to make sure that it is. And along the way, you'll see that there's all kinds of general tags or over-the-counter tags or something like that. It's, we're, we're really lucky as bow hunters to have, they, they don't, most game agencies don't take us all that seriously for the amount of animals we kill. So they don't, they don't mind giving us tags, right? Or letting us buy tags. Different story if you wanna buy a gun tag. So there's really good opportunities out there, but you gotta do your research. And I should say one more thing on this. If you're like, you know, I'd really love to go hunt mule deer in Western South Dakota or whatever, make sure you pay attention to the little things in the regulations. Make sure you pay attention to the opener. Make sure that you pay attention. If you're going to hunt public land, that there's not some youth firearm season or it's pheasant opener and it's closed off to you or something like that. We always, we have this, it's, it's just like human nature, right? We know our regulations in Minnesota or wherever we're from, so we assume they're the same when we travel and then you find out they're not. <laughs> There's all kinds of different regulations out there. Just before you buy that license, make sure you know what you're buying, make sure the time frame works for you, do some research. And that's the good thing about it is you can do all that stuff now. So I've mentioned public, ha public land about a million times here. The reason I say that is because I'm, I'm just into public land. It's, I, I don't have a problem hunting private land. I mean, if anybody here wants to offer me up their farm, I might come there hunt it. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not saying I wouldn't. I'm just saying in my travels, I've been to a lot of states. I've, done, I've hunted a lot of different critters. I found that I like just resigning myself to hunting public land. Then I can plan the entire thing. I can have backup spots. I'm not, I'm not worried about anybody else's rules or stepping on anybody else's toes or anything like that. It's just mine. And I have to say this about it. If you've had bad experiences on public land, like we all have, like if you've hunted Carlos Avery here and you've had people stepping all over you and you've been dodging 22 bullets zipping by you, I get that. I've been through all of that stuff. Uh, sometimes you just can't get away from that. Sometimes you gotta just drive. You gotta get out of here and go somewhere else. There are a lot of places, the same thing with over-the-counter elk in Colorado. If anybody's done that recently, it is a madhouse. I'm, I'm not saying you can't go get a bull, you might, or you might get a cow or whatever, but there are some places that are just saturated with people. That's where the research comes in. That's where all of the time you put in now matters. This is, this is obviously an outdated photo a little bit because he's using a paper map. Nobody does that anymore. Although we do, we do actually still use them in some places where we can't get reception. People will ask me all the time without, without outright asking me for GPS coordinates. <laughs> they'll ask me where I hunt all the time. Here's the thing about it. I, ha I have a few spots that I go to year to year in public land that out of state that are awesome. And they just have stayed consistently that way. Most of the time it changes. Most of the time I'm finding something new every single year. Might be a general area, but it, 
w one thing that really, it was a really good lesson that I've learned doing what I do is it is very rarely the same two years in a row out there. So I have to find new spots. So I have to research all the time. I use, I, I start sort of blanket, right? I just like want to pick a part of a state that might not have very many people. I have a, I have a few simple rules for that. So I got asked yesterday when I was doing my seminar about Nebraska. One of the things I look at, if I were gonna pick Nebraska and I wanted to mule deer hunt, or let's say whitetails. If I wanted to whitetail hunt Nebraska, the first thing I would do, I won't give away too many secrets, the first thing I would do is I would look and I would say, well, there's two major population centers. There's Lincoln and there's Omaha. And then on the other end of the state, there's the Pine Ridge area where a lot of people go to hunt because it's got Miriam's turkeys and it's got antelope and it's got uh, mule deer and whitetails. And then there's all these other parts of the state that just don't get as much attention. So I would immediately X off those three areas. And then I would start looking elsewhere. Um, same rules apply if I'm going to Oklahoma for whitetails, if I'm going to North Dakota for mule deer, anything like that. The, the very first thing I'm doing is I'm like, okay, where in this state is it not that popular to go? Just, you know, you can check the hunting forums or whatever, do a Google search and see. And then where are the cities? I wanna get away from that stuff, simple. This, this depends entirely on what species you're hunting. You know, your, your digital scouting is gonna be different if you're looking at elk versus antelope versus whitetails versus whatever. But my main goal at the onset of finding a spot is always about access. Easy access, I don't care what critter it is, if it's too easy to get in there, there'll be people in there. The easier it gets, if they can take four wheelers on a certain kind of public land or something, I'm not going there. I want it to be, I want to find the situation where you can outwork most of your competition. And that's not that difficult on a lot of hunts. It's gotten a little different out elk hunting where there's this, this mentality that you need to hike eight miles in and it, it, it's a little bit different there. But for most hunts, it's simply figuring out where people either won't go, don't want to go, or can't, not everybody can get to. Um, that might mean wading up a river to access something. It might, it might mean something as simple as one, one, access, one legal access on a property and the far corners of it fewer people go to. That has been a really simple rule for me to follow for all of my non-resident, out-of-state, public land hunts, elk, everything. That's the first, a good place to start. I do that before I look for anything else, before I look for water holes, food sources, any of that stuff. What I wanna figure out is how many people are gonna go in there. How can people get in there? And we hear this, we, so this is like the social media world. If you were to, if you were to check out random celebrity hunters on Instagram, you would swear to God everybody was hiking 47 miles in with 100 pounds on their back and you know working their tails off the whole time. When I go out west, I don't see most people working very hard. Uh, I just don't. Sometimes you do, you'll run into somebody way in the back country or somewhere like that. Most of your competition doesn't wanna work that hard. So you can, if you're willing to put in the time, that's the first thing you can do. You can get away from those people. You can get away from most people if you're just willing to not do, or to do something they won't do. So I just gotta, I gotta talk about a couple of things that I live by beyond that. Um, there's just a few things I look for almost no matter where I'm going. And like I said, if I wanna get away from people, I just start climbing. Um, you wanna go on a, you wanna have an awesome out-of-state whitetail hunt? Find a place where you can park on the bottom of a hill and either stay on the bottom or hike up the hill. Because once you start hiking up there, 80% of your competition's already left behind. You hike to the top of that hill and you hike a mile back, now you've left the other, you know, another 15% behind. It's dumb, simple stuff. If you do your homework to look for a, a couple spots like that or half a dozen spots like that, you get in there and you ground truth them. You see, well, yeah, I was right on this one. Or sometimes you'll get into a situation like that and you go, nobody's hiking back this far. But all of a sudden you'll see a two track from the neighboring farm that isn't public and guys are parking there and walking in. Sometimes that stuff happens. That's why I spend so much time now lining up spots, A, B, C, D, E, however many I need, because no matter how much digital research you do, no, no matter how much planning, you drive out to a place like that, you know, you might think you found the best secret spot in Colorado ever. You get to the trailhead and there's three outfitters parked there and you know, 17 camps and it's just not a secret. So what, what now? Do you ride it out there or do you find something else? If you have that, if you only have the one spot, you're gonna stay there and probably not have a very good hunt. 
my favorite, favorite way to access hunting stuff, hunting properties is to walk through rivers. Either walk straight up them if I'm not gonna drown or walk across them. Once again, people just don't wanna do it. Um, some of the best mule deer and whitetail spots I've ever found traveling to hunt involved simple hikes along a two track and then wading across rivers that are like knee high. And then all of a sudden, as long as they can't get in some other way, most people aren't gonna do it. It's just, it's simple stuff. All of these things, it's, it's, it's all about putting all of this stuff together. So not, not, you can't just go find a river and win, right? You have to find that access. You have to find that, that public land that has the river on it maybe, or the, the, the type of access that's far enough away from people where you start building all this stuff into your search criteria. It's kind of like investing in your own portfolio. You're like, you know, okay, I, this is my risk level. So these companies have to meet this, these various levels of criteria here. Same thing. Same rules apply. And if it doesn't, that's the beautiful thing about public land. There's so much of it out there that you can go find something else. We are so lucky in this country to have this resource available to us. This is the, this is the hardest sell that I'm gonna have here. When you go out and you're gonna hunt elk, you're gonna say, I'm gonna get there on September 8th and I'm gonna hunt through the 20th or something, right? and you've done all your research, you've been going to the gym, you've been crossfitting like crazy, you're, you're shredded, you're ready to go, and then you get out there and you just wanna go, right? We're gonna charge through this countryside, I'm gonna hit that farthest meadow possible, I'm gonna be blowing bugles off left and right, and you get in there and go, there's not really much elk sign here, there's an outfitter tent 800 yards away. All of this research only matters until you ground truth it. So you can give yourself an amazing advantage by doing a bunch of pre-hunt planning and research, but until you get in there and see what's going on, you don't really know. And so I always tell people, no matter what, try to build in a day or two where you're not focused on hunting, you're focused on watching or hiking into these different areas and figuring stuff out. Um, I was just having a conversation with a guy I know down here on the floor who was asking me about hunting whitetails in South Dakota. And he was asking me about some of the walk-in ranches out there, and I've hunted South Dakota a lot. The one thing I figured out out there is you may look and see a 5,000 acre ranch here and a 7,000 acre ranch here, and all of it looks like amazing whitetail ground. But what happens is you get in there and there's been 100 head of cattle in this pasture for two months and 200 cows in this one, and you walk through there and it is a deer desert but then you'll cross a fence back in there where the cows haven't been for three months and that's where all the deer are. So I can look at it on my aerial photography or I can remember, oh, I hunted in here, I killed a buck here last year. When I show up there, it's always different. And until I walk in there, I just don't know. If you can just spend one day watching, just figuring it out. If you find that river bottom you think is gonna be full of whitetails, use your aerial photography, go on your Onyx, go on Google Earth, whatever, find a glassing point get in there before sunrise, get set up and see how many of those bucks are crossing those rivers. Figure it out. Uh, mule deer, same thing. You're, I feel like I'm getting old, partially because my wife reminds me of it a lot because I'm getting super crabby. Um, I think that's having two seven year olds, I don't know. But I'm, I find myself trying to be way, way more patient with this stuff. Because I know the more that I can sit back and not mess with them and, and watch, and see what they're doing, the better off I am when I, when I make the time to go in there, when I make the call to go in there. It's a really hard thing to do, especially if you only have like five days if you go do a mule deer hunt or something close to home, but it is, it is so worth it. This, this may not seem that important to the overall process. Where are you gonna stay? At this point in my life where for probably a decade now, I've spent like 30 to 40 days in a tent throughout the year, I'm pretty over being in a tent. <laughs> the novelty of camping is worn off for this dude. It is just the most cost effective, efficient way to do these hunts. Now, of course, if you're going elk hunting, you're gonna, you know, you're, you're not staying at the Holiday Inn, right? But there are a lot of hunting opportunities out west where you might find a rinky-dink motel 20 minutes away or something like that. If you can camp where you're gonna hunt, you can be so much more efficient. You can walk right out of your camp, go hunt, it just really makes a difference if you travel with a couple of buddies and you only have one vehicle, so you're not driving back and forth or you don't have to pick somebody up. There's nothing worse 
than sitting on a mule deer waiting for it to get up and move or something and your phone's buzzing because your buddy needs to get picked up down the road. Now you gotta make something happen. A couple of the other reasons I like to camp besides being able to camp right where, right where I wanna hunt, it's cheap of course, but I can butcher an animal in camp and I can plan, I, I can really easily plan at least one good meal a day because we tend to treat these things like a vacation and you should be, you should be having fun, right? But after five days of eating donuts and hot dogs, you're like, I'm not, I don't have a lot of go juice left. I'm tired, I've been sleeping in a tent. I'm at this point in my life now, every year, whatever, whatever trip I'm going on, I'll throw in uh, a bunch of venison, a bunch of asparagus, broccoli, peppers, whatever, vegetables, grab some good rice and I'll have one meal. Like when I come back to camp at night, I can take that bag, I've got, I've got olive oil in there, I've got everything ready to go. I can dump that in a frying pan on my little cook stove and at least I have one good solid meal with the right stuff in it. When I'm in a motel situation, most of the time I'm like, where's the nearest Burger King or what, what's easy? Cause you get lazy, you know, and it's just, all of that little stuff helps. You know, if anybody who's been elk hunting and you've eaten Mountain House for seven days, you know, like you would kill for some fresh asparagus and a backstrap, you know, I mean, uh, little things like that that you can control matter a lot on a hunt. I'll just, I'll just briefly touch on this. I, I said this before and I'll say it again and I'll say it again because this is a lot of times the time and the logistics and the money are the hangups we have. This, this kind of hunt, these kind of hunts that I'm talking about, aside from, let's say you go elk hunting now, there's no way around it. You're gonna pay 650 bucks to 1,000 bucks for your license. That's just what they're gonna get. And it's, it's not gonna be cheaper next year. It's what they're gonna get. Whitetails, you might be 200 to $500, depending on where you go. All of that is just, that's a pay to play thing. You're gonna have to do that. You're gonna have to fill your truck up with gas. You got, you got some of those costs, right? But you take the difference between staying in a tent every night where you might be able to camp for free or it might be six bucks a night or 15, depending on where you're at, versus a hotel, which might be 50 to 100 bucks a night. For most people, there is no reason that you couldn't do this financially. If you knew you were gonna go on a hunt like this next year, you could throw 10 bucks in a piggy bank every week and make it. You could have an awesome hunt. I'm gonna, I'm gonna dig into philosophy a little bit and go sort of hippie Zen master on you guys here. Do not set yourself up for failure. So there's so many things out there you can't control, right? You can't control the weather. You can't control the hunting pressure. You can't control if some dogs run through and boot those deer off that you've been scouting all week. You can't control that stuff. You can control if you can hit a bullseye at 40 yards you can control if you can put 50 pounds on your back and climb a hill. There's things you can control, things you can't. You can control how well you know your equipment, all of that stuff. Any of these little things you can do to get yourself in the right place. And I know this seems dumb, right? You think, well, if I'm going elk hunting, of course I'm gonna be good at shooting. I can't tell you how many people I've had come with me on hunts where we'll go like on an antelope or a mule deer spot and stock hunt where you're not gonna shoot one at 20 yards most likely. It's gonna be, 30, 40, 50, 60 yards probably, just realistically, if you want one chance in five days. You know, you might get lucky and get real close. Odds are probably not. It's gonna be twice the distance of a typical whitetail shot. And they'll get out there and they don't have any confidence to shoot that far. And I'm like, you could have taken care of this for the last, you know, eight months and didn't. Um, don't sabotage yourself that way. That, that kind of thing that you know you screwed up on uh, eats at you when you're out there and it takes away your enjoyment because you know you sabotage yourself a little bit. Um, take care of that stuff. If you're gonna, if I, this is gonna be a little bit of a weird segue, but at this point in my life, I'm super into the experience. I just, I love these kind of hunts because I learn, I get to plan it. It feels good to, to do it. Um, but I, I love when I, when I don't screw up on these things. I love when I feel prepared for them. Uh, it's just generally a better experience. You'll hunt smarter, you'll have a better attitude, everybody will be happy, you have a better chance of success, and everybody wants that. This is like my point to the stands call here. I'm gonna shoot a big, big whitetail on this tank this year, I'm calling that shot. I killed a pretty nice one on it last year when I found it. I'm gonna kill a bigger one this year. We wanna go out and we wanna hunt however we're supposed to, right? If you're gonna go elk hunting, you wanna be that Corey Jacobson caller who can bugle up a bull from anywhere and uh, move through the mountainside until you get on them and cut them off and call them in. You go antelope hunting, you wanna crawl up on them, whatever. The reality is it's, it's pretty hard sometimes to get out of your element. There's nothing wrong with, if you're an ambush hunter, which we all are, if after four days of spotting stock and critters and you're getting your butt kicked, go sit on a water tank. 
Who cares? Have fun, hunt to your strengths. If, if you know, all of us, to some extent, the success or, or giving, us a, uh, giving ourselves a good shot of success is important, right? You wanna succeed. If that means you gotta post up after a couple days and wait for a thirsty one to come in, go ahead. Um, if, you're, if you're pushing a dead program or you're not enjoying it, do something else, because this is supposed to be fun. So don't be afraid. I see people get locked into a certain kind of hunting strategy or method or whatever. And you know, if you're way better at reading sign and checking the wind and deciding this is where they're gonna go through, you know, these elk are gonna walk through this little hogs back or whatever, do that. Who cares? Have fun. But don't forget, those are your strengths. I have to throw something like this in every seminar I do. I write about this a lot too. I, I'm at a point in my life where I care the least amount of big, about big animals as I ever have in my life. It's just having kids, I've been around the, the hunting industry a long time. I've seen the trophy thing to the nth degree. I just don't care that much anymore. I love big animals. If a 350 inch bull elk walks by me, I'm gonna fall apart and try to shoot it, for sure. I'm not gonna pass it up and shoot a littler one. But the reality is I just don't, it's not, you, you, you kind of figure out, like when I had my little girls, I was like, wow, you know, 140 inches aren't that important. They're awesome, right? 140 inch buck is great, but it's not that important. <laughs> you know, like nobody, I care, very few people care what I shoot, you know? Same thing with everybody else. So I always tell people, please, if you're gonna do this, you're gonna put in all this work and this money and take that time off from, for your job, please keep your expectations where you're gonna be happy with them. The, the trophy mentality, I, I, and, I, and I personally don't care whatever you wanna hunt for. If you're ready to hunt 400 inch bulls on public land in Colorado, go for it. If that's gonna make you happy and that's where you wanna be, fine. But what happens is we focus on this, this idea that we're gonna go into these new places and our expectations are so much higher than what's actually gonna happen. I always think about this guy I talked to at the game fair two years ago who was going on his first elk hunt in Colorado. And we were just talking about it because I was going to Colorado too. And he told me, he said, I'll be, I'll be really happy with like a 330 bull. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, would you be happy if somebody handed you $100,000 right now? Like, duh, but come on, it's not, neither one of them is gonna happen, you know? Um, that would be like some random dude from out west being like, oh, I wanna go to hunt Minnesota public land and a 150, 160 whitetail would be, I, I wouldn't let him walk, right? Hunt for what's gonna make you happy. Um, I always, I always show this picture, that little eight pointer there um, in velvet there. I snapped that photo in North Dakota one year. Um, I'll make a long story short. Hunted, I had four days. The, my little girls were really little then. So I, I didn't have much time to get it done on public land. I had an awesome opportunity at this super wide velvet buck, fell apart, missed him twice. Last night of the hunt, I hadn't killed anything. My two buddies hadn't killed anything. I'm like, man, we're gonna go 0 for three. Went out to my stand, uh, you know, tied my bow up, climbed up into my stand, I pulled my bow up and there was a rattlesnake down there that recoiled when I picked up my bow that I hadn't seen when I was at the base of my tree stand. So I thought, holy cow, like how lucky, how lucky did I get? I didn't have, I didn't have a clue it was there. And it was, I'll, I'll never forget that experience of picking, you know, how the bow comes up off the ground and seeing the ground move away from it. And I was like, so I watched that rattlesnake go away and I remember sitting there in the sunset and I'm on the river bottom and it was a beautiful night. And I just remember thinking, well, it's not gonna happen. You know, I'm going home without one, whatever. You know, it's like, it's just this kind of calm settled over me. And I literally just accepted that. And I heard something, I looked over and that little eight pointer came walking in and I shot him at 15 yards and he tipped over. <laughs> so, and it's one of my favorite experiences. And the point of that is, if I show you this 75 inch buck that I killed, people go, I'm not traveling to shoot a 75 inch buck. I get that, right? But there's so much more to it than that. The experience, you know, I spent four days in camp with my buddies. There's so much more to this than just a score or how big it is or, you know, how quickly you can put it up on Instagram and get a bunch of likes or whatever. And then you might have the best hunt of your life. So I bet, I, I always try to, be very realistic because I don't want to send people out and have them think that they're going to kill big stuff. Here's the thing. I've killed by far my biggest whitetails and obviously my biggest mule deer and stuff on public land on these trips. Do it yourself. You, you can make this happen. And the crazy thing about it is when you get into some of these places and you've done your homework, you don't know what's going to come by. You could have something like this, which is incredible. Um, 
And that's like such a good thing, like that, that carries us as bow hunters, <laughs> where we're like, that possibility is awesome. This is a crazy one, but a lot of people don't prepare for a dead critter. Um, if you do all your homework and you're a pretty good hunter and you go out and do this, you might kill something. How you get it out, how you take care of it. We talked about antelope and how delicious they can be before. If you're not prepared to get something out, you're in for a horrible part of your hunt. Um, anybody who's packed an elk out knows that. It's not, it's never fun. <laughs> Even if you had to pack an elk 200 yards by yourself, it would be a horrible experience. They're never 200 yards from anywhere you need them to be. You think, oh, well, I'll go hunt. You know, we, when we shoot whitetails here up by Ely, we just drive the four-wheeler back there. Whitetails are easy to get out or whatever. You go into a walk-in ranch in South Dakota, you can't bring wheels in there. Can't use a game cart. So you're, you're dragging or you're packing. Um, dragging a, white, a big whitetail, even dragging a small whitetail, isn't that much fun after a while. Um, my buddies and I, well, my buddy and I, we killed a couple deer down in Oklahoma this year, um, and he shot a button buck one morning on this public land way the heck back in there. And you know, a button buck in Oklahoma is not very big. Um, you can just about put it in your pocket. But by the time we drug that sucker across this half frozen creek three times and got it to the truck, I was like, we're not shooting any more deer back there. <laughs> I don't want to take anything bigger than that out of there. I, I carry an oversized pack anyway because I have to carry some camera gear and stuff. So I usually carry a bigger pack than I need a lot of times. But I always have in there, I have uh, some replaceable blade knives, super, super scary sharp, where you can pop out that blade, put a new one on there, you know, Havilon, a couple other people make them, or a couple other companies make them. Um, I always have, you know, 15 one quart uh, Ziploc bags in there or a couple of game, bigger game bags for the meat because there's certain situations where you might go, you know, get on a mule deer in the morning and have the opportunity to, to piece it out right there and pack the whole thing out. and. Packing a whole deer out, if you know how to take them apart, isn't bad most of the time. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're now down to, even on a big buck, maybe 50, 60 pounds of that deer that you have to carry out. Um, if you have all the meat and you really do a good job of getting the bones out and everything. But if you don't know how to do that, or you're not prepared for it, that's when you run into trouble. Have a place to cut them up, don't lose any meat. If you go on a hunt, um, I've been on early season hunts, where we've had success on like a September opener, like early September opener where it's 80, 90 degrees and there's no ice to be bought anywhere within an hour of there. Um, just prepare for that kind of stuff. You go on an antelope hunt and it's August 20th and you thump a goat way out on the prairie, know how you can get it cooled off quickly, plan for that stuff. I've had a few <laughs> instances out, in the, out on the road one of them I probably have mentioned many times where I had a fence break on me and I thought I ripped my manhood off on a fence post in Oklahoma. Uh, that was the worst one I've been involved with and that was a not good one. I still, every time I walk up to a barbed wire fence, I still cringe. I can't stand them. <laughs> I go under them almost always. It's dumb stuff like that that gets you. Everybody thinks they're gonna go elk hunting and they're gonna get attacked by a grizzly or a lion. And I, I'm not saying don't take grizzly bears lightly. Please don't do that. I'm not advocating that. But most of the time it's the dumb weather stuff that gets you or a snake, a rattlesnake in camp or something. Just not being aware, being a little cavalier about your surroundings. Probably the most dangerous, the two most dangerous things that you have to deal with are gravity. Whether you're in a tree stand or you're up on a side of a mountain trying to get on some elk or some mule deer or lightning. Uh, you get into the high country, we were talking about this on the way in here, you get into the high country and you camp for your first time and you're like, oh, I'm gonna get on some bull elk or some mule deer or something and that first storm rolls in when you're finally up in the clouds. You know, we're at 800 feet here above sea level. When you get to 10,000 feet and you're camping and all of a sudden a storm comes over the, the mountain and you're in it, it's not this distant thing, it's a part of what your little environment, that's a different world. Be careful with stuff like that. I'm not saying, you know, don't ignore the threats about the animals or anything. Be smart about that stuff. But just understand that you're getting into places and into situations where there is real danger there. We don't encounter that in the whitetail world very often, other than climbing up and down tree stands. So please be careful. I always have to throw this in there quickly. Please wear your safety harnesses. Um, please use lifelines. Please know how to use your tree stand safety equipment if you're going out there. Uh, I had a conversation with my wife about this. I talk about this a lot. My wife is a physical therapist. She treats people who paralyze themselves falling out of hammocks. And so if you think that you're gonna climb tree stands and fall out and be okay, I got bad news for you, buddy. Just be careful, please. 
So this is where I'm gonna make the case for everybody to take a once in a lifetime hunt every single year. If you follow the trends for some of these states, especially if you're dealing in the, in the, in the elk world or the mule deer world, especially, but the whitetail world's getting hit by it hard too. There is no better time than now to plan this. This is not gonna get cheaper. Wyoming isn't gonna suddenly decide they wanna give you a 50% break on your tags. It's not gonna happen. It's only going up. If you look at what these states are doing where they're passing these resolutions and everything, where they're going, okay, we know we can step this up to, I think Kansas just did something where the, the ceiling on the non-resident license tag for a deer is gonna be $900. So you don't know if it's gonna get there, but it could. It's not gonna get cheaper. It's not gonna get easier. Lots and lots of people wanna do this stuff and they say, I can't do it or I'll do it in three years or I'll do it in five years. You don't know what life has in store for you. You don't know what you know physically is gonna happen. You slip on the ice here. If you, if you have the inclination, these opportunities are here now and you don't know if they'll be there in the future. It's getting harder to find places to go buy an elk tag. Mule deer populations are real susceptible to fluctuations. The whitetail world has gotten a little more uncertain in the last few years. If you have the inclination, please go.